began Every star and every planet Has been fashioned by your hand All creation holds together By the power of your voice Let the skies declare your glory Let the land and seas rejoice You're the author of creation You're the Lord of every man And your cry of love rings out across the lands Yet you left the gaze of angels Came to seek and save the lost And exchange the joy of heaven For the anguish of the cross With a prayer you fed the hungry With a word you stilled the sea Yet how silently you suffered That the guilty may go free You're the author of creation You're the Lord of every man And your cry of love rings out across the lands With a shout you rose victorious Wrestling victory from the grave And ascended into heaven Leading captives in your way Now you stand before the Father Interceding for your own From each tribe and tongue and nation You are leading sinners home You're the author of creation You're the Lord of every man And your cry of love rings out Across the lands You're the author of creation You're the Lord of every man And your cry of love rings out Across the lands Well, uh, good morning. Welcome. Good Welcome morning. To... It's good to see you. Did you like our opening screen? No, I loved it. It was great. Bathed in Mediterranean light. Yes. So we just chose that because uh, we're starting a new series on Revelation. And that was Ephesus. Wow. The, the main street. As uh, those who have been there, you walk down it and you tread in the footsteps of St. Paul and, of course, uh, the Apostle John, yes. who we should be thinking about in a moment so we hope you uh, uh, benefited from seeing that right uh, just at the outset just we ought to acknowledge and um, say that uh, we want to send our condolences and prayers for the royal family mm. on the loss of uh, the duke of edinburgh yes. and you'll be praying for them as family a bit later but to acknowledge that yeah. uh, as we start and uh, in a sense join in the national mood uh, of uh, Yes. morning with them yes yes uh, and of course we have our own we had our own funerals this week as well that have taken place mm. and we'll continue to pray for those as well yes we will All right but uh, it's good also to unite i don't think we said we would do this but it would be good to do this yes. um not only unite with the national mood but those of us who are here in person those of us who are online um to just they, they will talk to us through the stream and we'll get comments backwards and forwards, but let's us just uh, give them a little round of applause. They, yeah. Okay. yeah. They have to take it on trust that you guys are here because they only see us at the front. Yes. And if you do have anything to contribute um, yourselves on the Facebook feed, uh, yeah. we, we'll see it as well. So yeah. if, you, if you're able to do that as we go along, I know some people find it difficult to concentrate on more than one thing at once but uh, um, I'm saying nothing <laughs> okay 
Right, uh, we're going to, there's a psalm we're going to start with, just a reading from that uh, to begin with. And it's Psalm 24. And uh, Revelation is all about the King, Jesus, and um, welcoming him and looking forward to seeing him. But uh, here is one that anticipates welcoming God into our midst. It's Psalm 24, and it's uh, verses 7 to 10. And it says this, Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. That's the one we worship. And uh, we're going to sing to him in a moment, but let's pray and invite him. Let's welcome him uh, into our gathering. We worship you, Lord and Father. You are the Lord Almighty, Yahweh, our God, the King of glory. And uh, we welcome you. We open the doors to welcome you in, that the King of glory may come in, that he may be here, not merely in our building, though we desire that, but in our own lives and in our hearts. So come in, and we come into our lives, we pray, and we lift our heads and our hearts uh, to welcome you. So we pray for your blessing. Lord Jesus, be present. Holy Spirit, come in power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So let's can start I, with a, a song. Sorry. 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 Put the brakes on. Put the brakes on. About not being able to multitask and deviating off the route. Sorry. Yes. I've got a question to, to ask everyone. Oh, you can ask it now if you like. Go on. Yes, I will if that's all right. Because yes. otherwise we'll forget because it's in my notes at this point. Okay. So uh, with restrictions easing this week uh, and as we go forward, they're continuing to ease. Who have you been able to meet that you haven't seen for a long time? Or who are you looking forward to meeting that right, you haven't yes. seen for a long time? Yes. And since we're talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus, we know you're looking forward to seeing him. Yes. You don't have to mention him. No, okay. But... Yeah, no, let's not be that holy. <laughs> okay. But uh, we're welcoming him. Yes, send an answer to that uh, to us. And... Uh, We'll connect with it later in, the, in our service. All right, so we are going to sing now. And um, this invites God himself to be with us. Behold our God. And uh, just to remind you that uh, we're still not supposed to sing out loud, but you can hum along as much as you like. And uh, we, we won't stand to sing. Okay, thank you. held the oceans in his hand who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to rejoice behold adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore him Who 
Okay, that's that was a great song. Great, it is indeed. It is. Oh, am I muted? Ah, uh, yes. Um, hang on a minute. Just I'll start with family. Some family news then. Whilst you're, no, I'm not. I've probably been un singing unmuting. along, everyone. Sorry about that. You probably heard me. Um, just to say thank you for everybody who prayed for the two funerals that we, we were connected with this week. Mm -hmm. um, for those who came here, supported us for Helen's funeral. And those who prayed also for um, Auntie Ethel's funeral, uh, which Colin and uh, Rosemary were not able to attend, but there was a link for them, so they were able to see it. Um, there will be um, a recording of uh, Helen's funeral uh, available. Uh, John is going to put it together, make some DVDs, but we could also, if you wanted to see it and you weren't able to catch it, then um, we could make those available too or put it on the YouTube channel. Mm. Um, so... Yes. And you'll be praying for that uh, later, later as on. well. Yes, I will. And we've got some other family news this week. Um, we've got some birthdays. I want to say two birthdays, but I think it counts as three mm -hmm. because Dan and Luke had their birthday this week. Yeah, so very course. happy birthday to them. Last year was their 21st and they weren't able to probably celebrate as they wanted to. And again, uh, uh, this year, so maybe 23 is the, the new 21, and yeah. we'll have a big party. It's Groundhog Year, basically, I think. Yeah, it? <laughs> I think so, yeah. Yeah. And also, um, it's a beautiful day today, not only because the sun is shining, but because it's Anitha's birthday. So, happy birthday to Anitha. Um, we know that you often tune in, as you can, so uh, sending all our love to you today. Excellent. So, um, have you got um, photos uh, of... Yes. Yesterday's spectacular or even, well, anything. Well, Show us. anything, Show us. all sorts of things. So first uh, of all, we need to say that Jan put out a challenge to the uh, discoverers to make an Easter box with some clues. And uh, so she gave them this example, which was um, uh, an Easter, uh, an egg box. Each one has some sort of symbol of the Easter story. So... Um, leaves for the triumphal entry when Jesus came in on the donkey, bread for the Lord's Supper that he shared with his disciples, silver coins that uh, Judas betrayed Jesus with silver coins, cloth, I think that's for the tomb, is it? Yes. And the stone, which was, oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. Right. Forgive me. The, the cloth, because... Um, the curtain was torn in two. That's why there's two pieces of cloth. Excellent. Got there in the end. And the stone, because it was rolled away and Jesus, uh, or it was rolled across when Jesus was buried. And the last one is empty because Jesus rose again and the tomb was empty. I think I've got that broadly right. 
Excellent. Uh, and the fiddlers have taken her up on this and have devised their own. So we can move. Oh, I have to move us on, myself on. So here's the fiddlers. They've got um, uh, tomatoes for um, the Last Supper. They've got a cross made of grass. They've got a paper donkey, very happy looking donkey, I have to say, uh, because he's carrying the Lord Jesus, I would imagine. They've got um, a leaf. I've gone round this, not in the right order. I've gone top to bottom, left to right, and I think I should have started in the bottom right and gone round in a circle. So a leaf and a donkey, a cross made of grass, the Last Supper, and a stone. I think that's a stone, isn't it, because it was rolled away. So well done, fiddlers, and you've got a nice Easter thing there. And we've come to the end of our Lent well spent uh, season. Oh, it obviously went on after. So I just want to tell you about the last couple of events that we had. So we had the Easter egg activity trail where, where we went around and uh, we had to find these nine different eggs, uh, the symbols of them, and we also had some activities to do at some of the stations. So on the first slide with photographs, we've got um, Zachary, who's looking at the first station where you had to try and work out which plant the different leaves came from. Um, we had that palm leaf and we had conker tree and we had bamboo and various other ones. You had to see if you could work out which was which. And then you can see Zachary again and uh, Alex and Paul are on another station where they had to do the wobbly egg and spoon challenge. I cunningly weighted the eggs with plasticine at one end to make a very wobbly plastic egg. They had to try and walk around different parts of the story. So you can see something that look, looks like a giant Lego brick, but it was in fact um, the Last Supper with plates on the table. That was the plan um, uh, until we got to um, the cross and the tomb. And then on to the next slide, we used our wobbly eggs to try and roll. We remembered that the stone was rolled away and we tried rolling the wobbly eggs and um, they, wob they roll all over the place. They don't roll in a straight line. Um, so here we've got um, Paul and Bernie um, and also uh, Emmanuel and Isaac and Mason and Lewis and Erin all trying to roll their wobbly eggs straight. And then we came round into the garden and we made um, these tombs, empty tomb, empty cross. So we've got uh, Sufian, you can see, and Emmanuel and Mason and Zachary. And it was hard to believe, that's why we've got um, the hand of Thomas. It was hard to believe, but it was, tr sorry, the hand of Jesus, which Thomas wanted to see, to believe. Um, it was true. Oh, and then the next slide, the last thing we did was we all had a boiled egg and we had to make a portrait of ourselves on the boiled egg because Jesus wasn't just there for his friends that day, like Thomas and all the others, but, but for us, we we're all invited to be his friend. And so we made a portrait of ourselves. And you can see Florence there in the middle. When you got home, you could eat yourself. And she loved that joke. Uh, and it's the first boiled egg she'd ever eaten. And um, so... This was really good fun. And you can see she's got the prayer sheet there. We had a little prayer to say that um, our eggs might receive a good punishment, but because of Jesus, we need not. Um, and so you can see Mason there doing his egg, and you can see Lewis and Erin also, because, of course, we had some chocolate treats to take home. So that was our Easter egg activity trail. And then yesterday, just to finish off the Lent well spent, we had um, Flan Ann. So um, we had uh, children and families and even Colin sent in um, questions to try and trick me. If I couldn't answer the question right, I got flanned. Um, Piers did the flanning, but I did, as you can see, get him back in the end. So that is the end of Lent Well Spent. Um, who knows what we'll do next? I might ask you, ask people what they would like. That's a dangerous thing, isn't it? Okay. So that's family news. Uh, it's now story time. Yay.
Now, I've got a picture. I want to start with this um, picture. Yeah. This is a picture of the Last Supper because we've just had the Easter season. And um, this is part of that story, the story when Jesus had a last meal with his disciples. And you might be able to spot there with a black halo in the bottom corner, Judas with his money bag. He loved money and he got those silver coins that he, he betrayed Jesus. That was the payment. But of course, all the disciples are represented there. And often we notice that Peter is pointing to Jesus. But there's one who's actually laid his head on Jesus's shoulder. Who is that one? Or on his breast? Well done. It is John. John was the youngest, and so he's not got a beard. He is pictured without a beard, traditionally. And, um, and he also said that when he was at the Last Supper, when he wrote about it, he said he leant on Jesus. Probably he leant backwards or sideways. He probably didn't go forward like that. But that's how he's often pictured, leaning on Jesus. Now, we know that all the disciples let Jesus down that night. They all disappeared into the night when he was arrested. And we often remember Peter and we remember Judas. But what about John, the one that loved Jesus so much he lent on him in the meal? Well, let's just trace his story through for a minute. He was the youngest. He may well have been um, Jesus's cousin. Maybe that's why he loved him so much and why they were so close. And um, he disappeared into the night, but he did get down to the courthouse with Peter. When Pe We know Peter stayed outside the courthouse. John was with him. John got him into the courtyard. Will you let my friend in? But then the trail that night goes cold. We don't know what he did. Maybe he snuck away in fear. We do know that he was brave enough to be there at the cross the day that Jesus was put on the cross because Jesus actually spoke to him from the cross. He saw him in the crowd. He was close enough to the cross for Jesus to speak to him. And Jesus said, take my mum into your home now. Look after her. Why he said that to John and not to one of his brothers, maybe his brothers weren't there. But it was John who had the privilege of looking after Mary. And the day that the ladies went and found the stone had been rolled away, where was John that day? Well, he was with Peter and the others. And when they came back and said, the tomb's been broken into, the body's gone, it was Peter and John who quickly sprung up. And because John was younger, he overtook Peter and got there first. He won the race. So he was witness to all these things. And we know that later on, after Jesus went back to heaven, oh no, before then, he was there that day when Jesus called out, have you caught any fish? And the disciples, who were just fishing for something to do, said, no, we haven't caught anything all night. And Jesus said, try the other side. And they caught so many. They had a barbecue breakfast with fish on the beach. And he was there that day and he saw what we often remember about that day, that Jesus took Peter aside. They had the little stroll down the beach and Jesus said to Peter, do you love me? And he said it three times. John was a few paces behind them and we don't often mention this. Close enough to hear, overhear that conversation. And after Jesus had asked Peter, three times, um, feed my lambs. He gave him a job to do in the church. He also spoke to him about how he would die in serving Jesus. And Peter heard that about himself, and he turned around and he said, well, what about him? Him who's a few steps behind. What about him? And Jesus said, if I want him to stay alive until I come back, what's that to you? You must follow me. In other words, don't bother yourself about anybody else. Don't bother yourself about John. 
You just make sure you are following me. That's all your job is to make sure you are following me. But because Jesus heard this, or because Jesus said this, a rumor grew up that John was never going to die and that when Jesus came back to earth, he would still be here alive and kicking. But of course, John said, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, didn't say, I'm never going to die. He just said, if I want him to stay alive until I come back, what is that to you? So after Jesus went back to heaven, John became one of the pillars of the church. Paul said he was one of the pillars of the early church when they were in Jerusalem. And he healed people in Jesus' name. He went and blessed the Samaritans. Um, when they became um, believers and uh, he did all kinds of things in support of the early Christians and he was a great fellow worker with Peter in particular. He was arrested because he preached so boldly about his friend, his dear friend Jesus. One by one those friends of Jesus were caught. Just as Jesus had said to Peter that day on the beach, you will be caught and you will die because I, you preach about me. One by one, that was true of all of them until only John was left alive out of those 12 friends of Jesus. And the story goes, it's not in the Bible, but there is a story that says that they tried to kill him, but he didn't die. But we do know that he was taken prisoner and he was put in a penal colony on Patmos where he had to do probably hard labor. He was punished because there was um, a movement in the Roman Empire that said Caesar is God. And John and all the Christians said Caesar isn't God, Jesus is God. And that got them into big trouble. There was terrible suffering for the Christians at that time. They were very discouraged. It was very dark days for anyone who said Jesus is God. And that's why he was arrested. But while he was there, God spoke to John. He wasn't that young man anymore. He was an old guy and God spoke to him and they gave him a message to encourage all the Christians. And we don't know whether he wrote it in Patmos when he was still a prisoner, but when he was released, he went to Ephesus, that place where we saw the picture of that main street at the beginning of today's service. That's where he went to live. And he certainly wrote while he was there. Maybe it was there. He wrote this encouragement down. And we call this encouragement now the book of Revelation. And if you know your Bible, you'll say, how is that an encouragement? I find that tremendously difficult. But it's a message that says, Jesus is God. Jesus is in charge. And all those who keep hold of that message will be proved right. And God will honor them. So don't give up. And it said not in the Bible that John was so old when he was in Ephesus, that they had to carry him to the church services and the prayer meetings. And uh, we don't know whether that's true, but isn't that a great picture of that young man who ran to the tomb being so faithful all his life that he was then the one that was carried to church. The young became the old. And his message always, the, the story goes, is little children love one another. So he passed on the message of Jesus to the new little ones. Uh, in a few moments, um, Ian is going to speak to us about the first few verses of Revelation, but the great message is Jesus is coming back in Revelation. What a great message. And Awesome Cutlery is going to um, sing to us now just that exact message. Oh, This just in, Jesus is coming back. We are looking forward to a 
a better day. When all pain and crying is taken away. No more sin or darkness. Every wrong made right. Jesus Christ is coming and he is the light. He's coming back again because he promised to. He's coming back. Okay, uh, thank you, Anne, for that great introduction to, uh, uh, or the background, I suppose, the introduction to what we're thinking about in Revelation, but the background to John's life, John who wrote what we're going to read. We're going to read from Revelation chapter 1. Uh, it'll be on the screen uh, if you'd like to follow. This is the introduction to one of John's writings that he produced uh, as an older man. He was probably very old as he wrote these things. So it's, it's Revelation chapter 1. We're just going to read the first uh, eight verses that um, set the scene for us. So here we are in Revelation 1. And it starts, The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what soon must take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and for the seven spirits before his throne, 
and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest, to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power for ever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. There's John's opening words. Now, uh, this week you may have heard um, that uh, the leader of the Labour Party visited a church in North London um, to look at a program that they were uh, had established to uh, support the vaccination uh, program. It's a black majority church and they felt it was important to encourage members of that community to have the vaccine because there's been a low uptake. Well, so the Labour leader goes and he sees it and it's great and he puts a video online to say how wonderful it is that uh, churches are doing this. Um, I didn't see the video for the reason that follows. Uh, when that video went out, his own supporters um, there were, criticized him. There was a barrage of criticism because the church uh, was not LGBT friendly. And uh, for instance, the, the pastor had uh, spoken against gay marriage. And they felt that was a reason to, that they should oppose him. And they criticized uh, Sakir Starmer quite heavily. And uh, fairly shortly afterwards, he put another video out uh, apologizing for going to this church and uh, apologizing for offending um, the members of the party and he took down the other video which is why I haven't seen it. So that caused a stir didn't it because actually this is the way that the outside world often behaves. Christians find it, other people find it too of course, that when you, you, you don't fall into line with a current important belief then you find yourself cut off, excluded, or even persecuted. And that's what's happened to John and the church. Uh, because they would not say Caesar is Lord, Caesar is God, um, then they were persecuted. And John himself was exiled, and uh, the church churches were being persecuted. Now he's writing to seven in particular here in the letter, and what we call the letter the Revelation, he's writing sh seven short letters to seven churches. But of course, more than that, we're facing these troubles. So what's God going to do when we fall into trouble like this, when things happen like this? And uh, uh, well, we're not being persecuted, anything like the way John was. But what's gonna, God going to do? Is he going to lift us out of trouble so that we don't have to face it? Um, is he going to deliver the churches so that they uh, escape uh, persecution? Well, no. What he does is, if you like, he takes John to the cinema. Uh, he gives him this big, big picture of what life's about, what's going to happen, uh, what is going on. You see, because that's what we do. We wonder, don't we? We wonder when things go wrong, wh where is God in this? Uh, why is this happening to me? Um, what's God doing about this? And so here, God answers that question in a way by, by showing John what's going on behind the scenes. The book is called the book of Revelation, and the, and the very first word of the, um, of the book is Revelation. Um, you may actually know, if you've read an older version, that it actually says Apocalypse. And we often think of that as a really bad, terrible thing. The Apocalypse is coming. But actually, Apocalypse just means that the lifting of a cover or a veil, that's all it means. Uh, so that uh, what you cannot see is, is, is drawn aside yeah, uh, and you see that what previously you didn't know. And so John, if you like, is given this visual demonstration of what is happening on going behind the scenes, what God is and isn't doing. Uh, of course, that doesn't solve all your problems because sometimes when you know what God's doing, that's what makes it more difficult. And here we have things that are quite difficult to well, they're difficult to understand in the first place because of the picture language they use. But then when you realize what it means, you think, oh, goodness, this means that God permits evil to take place and does not immediately end it. 
and that in some way it fits within his purpose for the world. The suffering of the church is within his purpose for the world. And that's what you learn as you go through Revelation. And maybe that makes it more difficult. But it does give us the convictions we need to be able to stand in these sorts of, these sorts of times. And these opening verses, there's a lot in the whole of Revelation itself, but these opening verses give us some of the big keys and clues as those things are going to help us. So the first one is that um, Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. That's the first thing. I've heard it said that you can summarize the book of Revelation just in two words. God wins. Well, yeah, okay. But that, that, the danger in saying that is that you might think um, that um, there's a stage when God doesn't look as if he's winning or if he's not winning at all. Perhaps we should change it. God rules. That's perhaps better because that means all the time. Not at the end, all the time. Jesus, the ruler of the kings of the earth. I'm, I'm, I'm sure people raise their eyebrows at that sort of thing today. Really? Is that what you're saying about Jesus? Is that what it really means? But just think how ridiculous and crazy it was for, for John to claim it. And if it was true for him, it must be true at other times. You see, John, uh, as Anne said, he was the last of the apostles. The apostolic team that was formed by Jesus and appointed to be the church's founders, one by one, they'd been wiped out, eliminated. We don't know all the details of every one of them, but as far as we know, all of them died a martyr's death. And, but John, he's the last one. And of course, he survived to the end. He did die an old man in his bed. But uh, all the others have gone. And you might think, well, that's not much good, is it? All the founders eliminated. And the church, well, that had, that had spread across the Roman Empire, quite miraculously, but it was really weak. There'd been per periods of intense persecution. We think about Nero and his persecution, in, and during that persecution, Paul and uh, Peter were martyred. But there were other periods, and maybe now, at this time, John's writing towards the end of the first century. He's probably mid-80s, an old man. Um, he's facing exile. And uh, it, what did it look like then? Well, it looked like the Roman Empire was in charge. Unshakable. You talk about Jesus being the ruler of the kings of all the earth. But it seems the kings, they're doing the ruling, aren't they? And yet, you know, the Bible is insistent right through its pages that uh, God is the sovereign. Uh, he is the ruler. Uh, it is his will that gets done. The kings and the princes, what are they? Well, in Isaiah it says, that they're just nothing. They're just uh, minute specks of dust. Uh, the, the great powerful nations, what are they? They're just like a, a drop of water spilled from a bucket. That's all they are in the face with God. And the king, if you take an individual ruler, well, it says in Proverbs 21 that the heart of the king is in the Lord's hand. And difficult as that is, that is to understand because you think, well, why doesn't he move it this way instead of that way? That's really tough. To, there's no immediate answer, but it's the assurance we have. Jesus really is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And we have other, sta other statements here in this first chapter that, that talk about Jesus ruling. So you've got the way that the, the book opens. Um, he, he's the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. It, these are the things that really will happen. This is what God is in charge. It's God who's directing affairs. There's a lot of opposition to God in Revelation. There's a lot of the nations shaking their fists at God and saying, we hate you. But in, all through it, God rules. God will not be thwarted. And I think that's, that's what it means also at the end where you know, God says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Um, there's a similar phrase in, in Isaiah, um, written 750 years beforehand, where God says, I'm the first and the last. I'm the one that, uh, you know, I, I begin everything, I end everything. And uh, there's no argument about that. In fact, in Isaiah, he adds, uh, apart from me, there is no God. And we need that reassurance. We do need that reassurance that uh, uh, we're not just holding on to something that is going to fail us. It is God who is the ruler. So what other things does he, does he tell us to, to help us? 
uh, in this passage. Well, this, the, another thing is just to think about the, what our salvation means. We've experienced grace and peace and love. This ruler isn't just somebody who's distant. Actually, he's come to us and made himself known to us and saved us. So you've got some wonderful descriptions of what God has done. Uh, verse 4 and 5, he's promising grace and peace to you from, uh, these are terms for God, the one who is and was and is to come. That's God who is eternal. The, the seven spirits before his throne, that's the Holy Spirit he's talking about. And uh, often is described as a sevenfold spirit in the Old Testament, one of completion. And he's the spirit who's brought Jesus to us. And then, of course, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Those are reassurances about God himself making himself known to us and promising us his grace. He's not just some hard-hearted ruler in the distance who's going to lay down the law. He's one who comes to us in grace and gives his peace to us and shows us his love. Well, that's what the, the benediction is. We'll use this at the end of the service in verses four and five, uh, 5 and 6. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood. He gave himself for us and uh, he died for us. And uh, what has he done? He's made us a kingdom of priests to serve God. Often, often in our trials, we imagine that God has somehow changed towards us. He's somehow different. Uh, because things are, are bad, we've done something to deserve punishment. In fact, he's taken that punishment. It's all gone. He hasn't changed. He's constant towards us, and he, he shows his grace and his peace and his love continually uh, towards us. So those are things we need to hold on to, and that's what uh, uh, the whole of Revelation will reassure us, that God hasn't changed. He shows his love and grace to us. And then, of course, the third big thing that we mentioned in that song, in that great song by Awesome Cutlery, um, he's coming back. Jesus is coming back. That's the big message of Revelation. And it's how the book ends. It's interesting. It begins with this statement, he's coming back. And at the end, it says, come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, which means come, Lord. And it reminds us, actually, that the world is, not, is God's. Not that it doesn't belong to the nations or the peoples or their kings. One day, he's going to come back. C.S. Lewis, uh, who wrote the Narnia stories, he says in, I think it's um, in one of his apologetics books, um, uh, Mere Christianity, I think he, he says, it's like this, it's like a big play. Or, this is a big stage, and we're conscious that we are part of this big play. Um, of course, actually, there's no dress rehearsals, other, we're just in it. Um, but one day, that play's going to come to an end. There's going to be a final curtain. The curtain's going to close, and then the author of the play is going to step onto the stage. And that's exactly what we, we believe about Jesus. And it demonstrates who is the author, who is the ruler, who's in charge, not the presidents or the warlords or the nations or the industrial giants or the corporations, it's Jesus. And he's gonna to return to show that. So Christians may be downtrodden or ignored or persecuted or marginalized, but Jesus is Lord. And he's not abandoned his suffering people. He's going to return for those who are waiting for him. He simply asks that we exercise patience in the meantime. So those are just three of the bigger picture things that uh, uh, John is shown as uh, he is wondering about the state of the church. Uh, there that um, Jesus is the ruler and he has shown us his grace and peace and love poured into our hearts, and one day he's going to come back to fetch us. So we're going to pray, and then Anne's going to come back after a song, and we'll think a bit further about that. Let's pray together. Uh, we thank you that uh, we worship one who is Lord of all, who is the ruler of the kings of the earth, and the presidents, and the warlords, and the armies, and the corporations, and the nations. And whilst there are many things we don't understand about that, Lord, we pray that you'd help us just to hold on to that in faith. And uh, thank you that you have shown your grace and love to us in the Lord Jesus. And we eagerly anticipate that day when we shall see him when he comes back. So fill our hearts with this and strengthen us for the struggles that we have in our lives. And may we know that strength coming to us through the Lord Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Now we've got a song that uh, reflects on that, and it's um, one of Charles Wesley's hymns, in fact. Rejoice, the Lord is King.
Great song that uh, summarizes uh, John's points quite nicely, actually. Yes, um, good old Charles. Good old, you good old Charles Wesley. Yes, I do like the, the rejoicing, glorious hope. I think that's the part of what needs to be. You know, yeah, what we should yeah, be. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, uh, yeah. So we we've uh, put out the question: mm -hmm. uh, Who are we looking forward to seeing? Uh, given that people aren't allowed to say Jesus, we've, <laughs> we've struggled with this question. Yeah. Well, what can I say? Well, but Melanie did say she's looking forward to the uh, the hubbub of getting back to normal yeah. in the sense of we have worship together and it's all noisy and then we can sit and chat yes. um, without having on being on Zoom chat one at That's a time right. in a very disciplined way. And the kids run around and, and nearly knock us over. We're, yeah. we're beginning to miss that now, aren't we? So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah I must admit, I'm looking forward to seeing my barber. <laughs> we're, uh, Lynn, all, Lynn, we're all looking forward to that yeah you're looking forward as well yeah, Lynn is as well Lynn's done a very good job of keeping this under control but uh, you know I'm sure she's looking forward to me going and paying some money for a haircut yeah uh, yeah and uh, uh, Esther and Joe are coming to our garden I hope the sun stays out today it's only yeah. the second time we've seen them since we've been allowed again yeah uh, they've been busy rubbing shoulders or not rubbing shoulders in other people's gardens yeah Oh, well, okay. So, uh, yes. So, um, yeah, thanks for this uh, great introduction to, to John's message in Revelation. This is a message that um, good will prevail, but in, in our culture today, we quite often think that the good is a bit naive and yeah, yeah. Um, weak. Um, can we really have assurance that Jesus is the ruler of kings and that good will prevail? 
um, it is to do with faith, isn't it, in, in, the, in the end. But we do have certain things that will help us. I was just thinking that uh, the, the way Jesus defeated death and the resurrection are an important part of our confidence that uh, good will reign uh, because it's God who will bring that about. And if he's defeated our sins, we're cleansed um, from sin, uh, then uh, he can overcome sin generally. And if he's defeated the devil on the cross, then he can overcome him finally. So there's that sort of assurance that we base from Jesus himself and then and then it is to do with faith, isn't it, that um, Revelation talks about that Jesus as the ruler of the, of the kings of the earth, when in fact they were they looked pretty rampant at the time, mm. uh, destroying the church, and it looks as if everything would collapse. But over hundreds of years, it was the Roman Empire that collapsed and the church that uh, that grew. Um, yes. there's, a, there's a great uh, I won't I can't cite it. Uh, um, but there's a book called The City of God by August, St. Augustine, which is just that, that big theory. God's city will survive in terms of uh, his church, his people, um, and the city of evil will collapse. That's his mm. big theory. Yes, uh, and God often uses the, the, the most fragile threads or the, the moment mm. of greatest weakness to be the, his moment of triumph, yeah. the cross being the ultimate yes, example. Yes, that's right, yeah. Yes, yeah, so... Um, I guess that the question we need to say is, you know, crises can cause us to question everything. Maybe John was questioning everything before he got this message mm. um, and other Christians. Can we prepare for a crisis? <laughs> can you give us something practical? <laughs> to prepare for a crisis? Yeah. Well, well it's a bit like um, um, expecting children, isn't it? Uh, you, you prepare for that as best you can. You go to antenatal classes and the little thing turns up and everything everything changes. You realize you've got the theory, but the practice is only there now. So in a way, preparing for a crisis is a bit like that. We, we can prepare un, under God, can't we? We can say, we can make use of what the, the old saints call the means of grace. God gives us things to strengthen us, whether that's the Bible or the church fellowship, um, uh, the sacraments. They're important, aren't they, as well, for, for us? Yeah. Um, he gives us the, the means of grace to strengthen us uh, whilst life carries on. And we should make the most of those when the time is good, when there's good opportunity. Um, obviously, John, if, they persecute, if the church is being persecuted, you can't meet together in the same way. Oh, well, actually, we're not being persecuted, but we can't meet together in the same way. Um, so you make the most of those things while you can. You build up the stores, a bit like Joseph in the Old Testament. During the years of plenty, he organizes everything to put everything in storehouses for the years of famine that come. And we, it, it doesn't need to be persecution, does it? Uh, it could be just something that happens in our lives that causes life around us to fall apart. Well, we should prepare for those things by building up the stores of grace uh, within us. Because um, the danger is if you don't do that, if you lie around during the years of plenty, um, then, when the, when, then when the really hard time comes, you've got no reserves, you've got nothing. Yes. Yeah, in parenting courses, we talk about an emotional bank account where we have to build up good things in mm. our children. So when difficult mm. things happen, uh, they've got uh, emotional resilience and bounce back ability. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying the same thing should be true of our spiritual lives, that we should store up. Yeah. Yeah, we want spiritual bounce back ability because, mm. yeah, crises come, don't they? Things happen um, when it, it talks in the Bible, when troubles come, not rather than if. Well, we need to be ready in spirit for those things, even if we can't predict what it is that's going to happen, so that um, we, we find God's strength in there. We've learned to trust him uh, when things are going well, trust him in the light. Uh, when, when the darkness comes, those things still apply, we, uh, but we've learned to take hold of them, mm. you know. So I guess now we've got new opportunities that um, that we haven't had for a while that we can actually meet a few of us in gardens. Yeah, that's up right. To yeah, six or a couple of couples or a, you know mm. a couple of households. Um, I guess we're saying we can use that not just to catch up and to encourage one another socially, but to have uh, you know to, to encourage one another by talking about spiritual things, maybe praying together or yeah, I, yeah, I think that, what yeah, God so is teaching us. I think that's exactly what we need need to do. Take the opportunity now um, for six people. 
I know the weather's a bit cold at the moment, and uh, uh, but uh, as it warms up, six people in a garden, mm -hmm. share together, pray together. Yeah, yeah. You bring your own elements and do communion together in the garden. Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Indeed. Good. And uh, Good. we have a great thing called the uh, Inspire Band, which where we just three of us meet together, and we just instead of chatting about our lives, we um, ask one another, "How are you doing mm. in in your spiritual life?" and you know, what, what do you want to put in place next? What do you want to work on? And we support one another specifically in that rather than saying, I'm worried about my child. I'm, you know, mm. uh, the car needs servicing and we're, we're short of money. All the things we don't normally talk about, we don't talk about those. We just literally um, encourage and pray for mm. one another in our spiritual walk. Yeah, sounds great. I mean, if yeah. folk want to know more about it, you can... Fill them in on how it goes. How it goes. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to because it is really useful. Yeah. And it's a simple formula mm. that anyone can follow. Yeah, good. All right, so you're going to pray for us now and lead us in yes. prayer yes, at this I time. Am. Thank you. Okay, bear with me one moment. Father God, we want to say sorry that we lose sight of your plan and your purpose that we are not prepared for all that comes our way. We have not made best use of our peaceful times to equip ourselves for difficulties that lie in our path. And so we fail in thought and word and deed through the things that we, we do and say wrong and the things that we fail to do that are right. And we say, Father, please forgive us. As easing continues in England and other parts of the UK, we pray that we will become aware of the great needs around us in our church family and in our community. Help us to be ready to meet those needs, needs of body, mind and spirit. And Father, we pray, give us confidence in your rule and reign. We want to lift before you the Queen and the Royal Family at this sad time. Sad time for them and for our nation. We pray that as a family they will be able to support and comfort each and every one in that household. That they would comfort one another and bear with one another. Be with them in their funeral this week. And we want to pray for those uh, that, who we know and love who have uh, recently lost loved ones. We pray for Ken and his family. We pray for Colin and Rosemary, uh, for Roger and Marion and their families, and just ask that you would draw close to them and continue to show us how we can support them in this, at this time. We want to lift before you all areas of the world where uh, atrocities mean that uh, damage and destruction occurs. We pray for uh, the Chinese treatment of the Uyghur people. We pray for the uh, unease and rioting in Ireland. We pray for uh, ongoing violence of the military junta in Myanmar against their own people. And also, we're aware of the death of a journalist in Greece, the murder of a journalist in Greece this week, and the sectarian violence in Mozambique, to name just a few. Father, send your people to these places to bring comfort and justice and peace, to overturn corruption and greed and the abuse of power. In our own country, we're so thankful for the rollout of the vaccine and the easing of some restrictions, but we pray for self-control across our nation and a continued uptake of the jab. We pray that there will not be another lockdown. Give our government wisdom to make the right decisions that will keep us safe. And we pray that we, as your people here, will know how to support friends and neighbours. We lift before you all critical workers 
as the effects of the past year take hold in their lives and hearts. We pray for the necessary support to be at hand to enable them to recover from the stresses and strains of COVID. And we pray especially for those known to us in our own community. Help us to show and share your love and compassion, to live your gospel, to speak your truth, that we might bring hope and peace to many. For we ask it for Jesus' sake. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, that um, brings our time virtually to an end. Just uh, one particular notice would be to say that uh, this is Life Group Week, and I think uh, the second week, so some Life Groups will be meeting. Those are good means of doing what we were mentioning earlier, of trying to reinforce ourselves spiritually in the face of the pressures that we mm -hmm. undergo. So if you're not part of Life Group and you'd like to join one, please let us know. Um, quite a few are going through the prayer course, which actually is another way of reinforcing yourself spiritually, to, to, to think about what it means to pray. And uh, if you'd like to do that, please let me know. Well, we're going to use a blessing to end with that um, was there in the reading we had in Revelation. And it's uh, the blessing there from verses five and six. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, we pray that you may know that a blessing this week and our closing song reminds us that uh, he is coming. These are the days of Elijah, but they announce actually that he is coming again. of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord and these are the days of your servant Moses righteousness being restored and all these are days of great trial of famine and darkness and sore still we are the voice in
Jehovah. There is no God like 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 Jehovah. Because He comes riding on a cloud, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Behold, He comes riding on a cloud, shining like the sun. At the trumpet. 